Hello booktube and welcome to my bookshelves. So I hope you're all well. The heat wave in the UK has finally broken. We've had about four weeks of really lovely weather, but towards the end it was getting a bit warm. Um, and now it's raining. So today I'm going to do my July wrap up. So I didn't read as many books as I would have hoped this month. I got stuck on one particular book, which I will come to soon. But first, I had finished my third blind date with a book. So for those of you who don't know, I was bought a subscription service for my birthday, which is called a blind date with a book. And it's for six months. So they will send you every month I will get a mystery book in the post. It's in the crime thriller genre, but I don't know what's coming. There are little clues on the outside to tell you what, what the book is inside. And yeah, so I don't know what's coming. So my third blind date with a book was John Connolly's Every Dead Thing. I enjoyed this eventually. So this is the first in a series of the Charlie, the Charlie Parker thrillers and it starts with the gruesome murder of his wife and child and it is gruesome it is quite graphic and so the first the first section of this book yeah it's you know what you know what to expect going forward it's grim we then and that was well written. We then jump forward um, a year, 18 months, two years later, and Charlie Parker has left the police force and is now sort of freelance and he is trying to hunt down the murderer of his, of his family. But the first half of this book is almost a separate story. So he has been asked to trace, track down a missing girl um, which and she sort of she's sort of involved in sort of gangland crime families so he goes around and investigates and yeah it's and the story is a good book but it has nothing to do with the opening with the serial killer murdering his family it's you know it's about 250 pages, but it's there's nothing to connect it to the, the beginning. It's well written. Um, it's it's a, it's a good story. And there are a lot of characters to keep track of. Some too many. I, 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 get, I struggle with books that have far too many characters. And I'll come to that in a moment as well. And this had... A lot of characters and I start to lose concentration and track of who is what so so the first half of this book is this sort of separate story where he's tracking down a missing girl second half of the story we go back to the serial killer part of the book and he goes to New Orleans he's following a lead that will lead him to the person who killed his wife and the second half of the book is brilliant really really good so I really enjoyed this. The writing reminded me a bit of Stephen King. I think this book needed a little bit of an edit. But as for a first in a series, really enjoyed it. And I will probably go on a second date with John Connolly. I will see what the next one is like, because I really enjoyed this. Talking of Stephen King, the next one I read was part of my Stephen King reread project. And this is Need for Things. So I read Stephen King in the late 80s, 90s, and I think I sort of read this when it first came out, 91. And then it was about this point that I stopped reading Stephen King. Rereading this, I think I know why. This book is not good. So this is a story of Castle Rock, where Stephen King sets a lot of his stories and a shopkeeper has arrived in town where he will sell whatever you like, whatever your your deepest desires, he will sell them to you, but there is a price. Um, 
and you have to play a prank on one of your neighbours and things escalate to a big finale. And this book is 700 pages. It's massive. And as I said before, you have a whole town of characters. There must be 20, 25 different characters and storylines running throughout this book that you have to keep track of. And I found this book really repetitive as well. So a member of the town will go into the shop. They will buy, they will meet the shop owner, Lalande Gaunt, a very creepy shopkeeper. Um, they will have a conversation. He will sell them an object that they that has some sort of mystic, not mystic, magical. There's something odd about that that item. So, like, he sells a pair of sunglasses to a woman that used to belong to Elvis Presley, and when she puts them on, she's transported into Elvis Presley's world. That sort of thing. Um, but I found it quite repetitive. So you get a succession of customers and they all have the same the same sort of conversation with the shop owner and then he asks them to do a prank on one of their neighbors uh, which they do and then you get another point of view and they play a prank and then you get another one and and it and it's very slowly builds up to a to a finale and the finale was a bit of an anticlimax and Stephen King has been accused of not ending books well and i can see why this one is yeah it's not a it's not a good ending this is a good 400 page book squeezed into 700 pages but i will continue with my stephen king reread and hope they get better so next on my list for stephen king is gerald's game and dolores claiborne next i've got some non-fiction so i've got two non-fiction books to show you and the first one is about sex shakespeare and sex and love this is by stanley wells um, a great shakespearean scholar and in it he examines so the first half of the book he examines how sex is portrayed in elizabethan england sort of what's allowed what isn't allowed and the first section's very, very interesting. Second section, he will then go into the plays and highlight some of the the sexual puns and sort of examine in depth sort of half a dozen of the plays. So he does Romeo and Juliet and sort of Measure for Measure, Othello, and sort of plays like that. And as you like it, yeah, fascinating book. And yeah, and Stanley Wells makes it it makes it clear that some of the sexual puns are in are an actor's choice because they can be said both ways they can have the innocent meaning or they can have the sexual meaning and Shakespeare is very clever at allowing the actor to to choose between how they're going to play that part so it is an actor's or a director's choice sometimes if you like Shakespeare this is a fascinating read Shakespeare sex and love so my next book is also Shakespeare related and it is Richard III but this is non-fiction this is the ruler and his reputation and this tries to examine the real Richard III and not the Shakespeare version of Richard III so I won this on a competition on Twitter um, by mistake I should have been sent this this is the Arden Shakespeare Richard III. This is the play, the play script. And that's what I won. But what I was sent in the post was, was this. So then they sent me this as well. So I've got two books for the price of none. So this is by David Horsball. This examines Richard III's life. Now, the early life of Richard III is undocumented. Because he wasn't the eldest son of the Duke, he was unimportant. Nobody cared about Richard, poor Richard. It wasn't until um, his older brother became king that we start to get some more documentary evidence of 
which is said. So the first half of the book is quite subjective and is more a story of the time, sort of Henry VI, Wars of the Roses, it sort of examines that. Second half of the book is more about Richard III, how he becomes king, the princes in the tower, um, and his and his demise as well, and how he ends up in a car park in Leicester. Yeah, fascinating book. A little bit dry, a little bit academic. It's interesting, but not exciting. And finally, two books. So this is a continuation of the Sergeant Crib series. I've got I read two books this month. I've got one more to go, and then I finish the series, and then I'll probably do a wrap up of the series. So the first one I read was A Case of Spirits. He's a nice thin Victorian... Well, they're, they're written in the 1970s, but they're set in Victorian London. This is A Case of Spirit by Peter Lovesey. Sergeant Cribb um, is drawn into the world of the occult seances, which was very popular in Victorian London. And, um, and some thefts have occurred in households where seances have been held. He investigates, then there is a murder. This is a classic locked room style murder. So, so in this one you have a small group of suspects and they're all in the same room and they're having a seance, they're all holding hands. One of them is murdered and it is up to Sergeant Cribb to work out who did it and how. So this is absolutely fascinating and it's completely by coincidence that I'm reading this because I'm also rehearsing for Blythe Spirit by Noel Coward which is about a seance who and and my dead wife because I'm playing Charles and we do a seance and my dead wife comes back and only I can see her. A complete coincidence that I'm re reading this at, at the same time. Fascinating read though this is Case of Spirits. And the next one, so the penultimate Sergeant Quibb book is Swing Swing Together. Um, and oh this was completely different. So from the from the occult, from the dark gothic occult, we are now boating down the river Thames. So this takes as its inspiration um, Three Men in the Boat by Jerome K. Jerome, which was published in the 1880s or late 1800s. It's just been published when this book is set and um, and boating fever has taken over London. Everyone is out boating down the river trying to recreate this story. Um, and then a body is found in the river. So Sergeant Cribb and his, uh, and his colleagues undertake to recreate the Jerome King Jerome journey to try and discover who actually killed this poor man in the river. Fascinating read, full of great detail, exciting twist at the end as well. Yeah, these books just keep getting better and better, and I've only got one more left. So that was my July wrap-up. As always, talk to me down in the comments about those books or books that you've read that you want to recommend to me, and I will see you all again in my next video. Thank you for watching.